This is Whitley Strieber, and this is Dreamland. You've reached the edge of the world. Last week, Eric Von Daniken was with us on Dreamland talking about what he's going to be doing at Contact in the Desert. Contact in the Desert takes place in Indian Wells, California at the Renaissance Hotel from May 31st to June 2nd. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be talking for the first time about UFOs because I have a lot of interesting and unusual UFO and alien footage, which is quite authentic, and I never talk about it. But I'm going to, in my free lecture, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. Then in the paid lecture, I'm going to be talking about a new world. Remember that Phil Corso was told years ago that what was on offer for mankind was a new world if we can take it. Okay, well, we are in a crisis situation on planet Earth, and we need to communicate better with the visitors. This is what my book, my new book, A New World, and my workshop will be about. Now, today we've got three great guests who are all going to be with us at Contact. Brad Olson will be talking about Antarctic and Peru from firsthand experience. He's just back. Nick Pope will be talking about expectations for future disclosure and what may happen in the future. If anybody has an inside track, it's Nick. And then Linda Moulton Howe will be talking about Antarctica and all sorts of things like that. And guess what? They're all three with us today on Dreamland. We'll first be talking to Nick Pope. And I have to just say two words. Welcome, Nick. Well, more words. Welcome, Nick, and welcome back to Dreamland. Thank you. It's great to be back on the show. Yeah, it's been a while, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nick, uh, before we start and talking about what you're going to do at Contact, I'd like to just briefly go back to the Rendlesham Forest case. And I believe there are still some documents outstanding. Is that correct? Yes. There are two further Ministry of Defense files uh, relating to UFOs more generally, and policy matters particularly. Two files still to be released. They should be made public in, in the next few weeks, perhaps a month or two. But uh, we, we are slowly but surely getting there. Don't expect any smoking gun on either Rendlesham or the UFO phenomenon more generally. But it will, I think, take us a little further forward and show how seriously these issues were taken within the Ministry of Defence in the UK. But um, as, as I say, it's, it's not going to be a, a spaceship in a hangar smoking gun, but it will, it will take us forward. That's, that's um, undeniable. Well, good. I'm glad it will take us forward. And when you say forward, in your mind, what does that mean? Well, I think it means chipping away at the tired old cliches that are sometimes thrown out that these things are only seen by crazy people and no one in government takes it seriously. We now know, and of course the declassification and release of the British government's files have played a big part in this. We now know that that's not the case. We know that, that radar operators track these things pilots see them and chase them and film them. We've seen, of course, these three declassified U.S. Navy videos of the F-18 Super Hornets chasing the UFOs. And, and we know, again, largely from the British government's files, but also from the re revelations about the Pentagon's ATIP program, we know that governments do take this seriously at very high level and put a lot of resources into it in, in the military and in the wider intelligence community. Yeah, they do. And yet still things kind of go on the way they have for the past 70 years. After the official release of material of, of videos by the Pentagon and the admission that the study was ongoing, uh, the Louis Elizondo tape, of course, I refer to that was uh, appeared in the New York Times and the further stories in the Washington Post, Seth Shostak of SETI said, oh, that must have just been reflections on the cockpit window. 
And of course, later, I think it became clear even to him that that was an insupportable statement. But what I'm asking is this, really, Nick, if you have any idea about where to go with this, uh, there's loads of reasons of theories about the secrecy and loads of reasons that these things may be kept secret. I'm I'm not at all surprised by that. But will we get beyond where we are now? We've had, in 2017, we had a release of a couple of videos, but there must be thousands of hours. God knows what it's videos of. It could even be videos of aliens, for all we know. Well, sure. Luis Elizondo has, I think, gone on the record as as saying that, yes, there are many, many more videos along the lines of the three that we've seen, uh, colloquially dubbed Tac, uh, Gimbal, right. and Go Fast, and I think he said that there are clearer, better quality videos out there. I'm not sure they're necessarily going to give us an absolute cut and dried answer as to what this is, but there is clearly more data out there sitting in the Pentagon uh, or, or somewhere. And uh, as Luis Elizondo has said, um, it is. I guess, a process of trying to encourage, to lobby um, government, Congress, whoever, to to try to to take some further initiatives in this department. And in fact, as literally as we speak, a, a new story is in unfolding about all this. And uh, you mentioned the Times and the Post. Of course, Politico have been a big part of this too. And again, I, I think a couple of years ago, it would be unheard of to get reasoned, balanced, sensible, non-derisory coverage of this subject in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Politico. But here we are. So so the landscape is changing. It has changed already, and that's an ongoing process. But yes, literally, as we speak, Politico, of course, breaking this story about the U.S. Navy now issuing new guidelines for what their pilots, their radar operators should do when they encounter these mystery objects. I mean, just think back, I guess, you know, but I mean, for for listeners who may not, think back to where we were a couple of years ago, where, where the public position was, we're not even remotely interested in this. We don't investigate. We haven't looked at this since 1969 when Project Blue Book was terminated. Right. Now, here we are, fundamentally different ball game with with the U.S. Navy confirming literally yesterday and as reported in Politico that, yes, these objects are seen and tracked and chased, and, yes, we we better be doing more about it, and uh, proper processes are being set up. And, of course, all the time you ask where where this is going. One of the places I think it is going, it is there already, is, is Congress. The House Armed Services Committee is taking an interest in this, the Senate Armed Services Committee. So we, we are moving forward slowly but surely yeah we, slowly but surely and i think that that's actually the way to go because this is obviously behind the scenes of huge thing it's a fundamentally world changing thing and who knows what how it will react when the secret is out it may change very much change the way what i call the visitors act toward us. But now let's go on. We're going to both be at contact in the desert. I'm going to be actually, folks, talking about UFOs uh, in my free lecture, which is something I almost never do, but I do know a lot about them. You'd be surprised. And I have some very interesting tape that I don't think anybody else has, but we shall see. Anyway, I'll do, be doing that, and I'll be talking about my new book, A New World, in my second lecture, which is called um, Alien Contact, A Miracle Denied. And now, Nick, what are you going to be doing, if I may ask, at Contact? Sure. My lecture is rather mischievously entitled Defense or State? Question mark, And it starts with the rather provocative question, which might strike people as a little odd. If an alien spaceship unexpectedly docked with the International Space Station, should our astronauts call the Department of Defense or the State Department? <laughs> and I, <laughs> That's a really good one. Yeah. And I, it's it's a, a humorous introduction 
to a serious point. And the serious point, of course, is where in government does this subject best sit? And, of course, it's, it's a much more complex question, I think, than, than people realize, because, uh, again, if we cast our minds back to, I, I guess, December 2017, just before the New York Times broke the story about the ATIP program, people were speculating, well, the U.S. government must be doing this, but maybe, maybe CIA has this, maybe NASA has this. Um, maybe the United States Air Force has this, and they were all wrong. It was the Defense Intelligence Agency, and then putting it out to private contract. And now we see that, somewhat counterintuitively, it's not the Air Force, but the Navy. Again, it seems to be, comes back to the Navy that's at the forefront of this. So that's really what my, my lecture at Contact in the Desert is going to be drilling down into. and and. I also explore questions like, does the agency in which you put the, the policy lead for this subject, does that have a bearing on how policy is handled? And, and my view, and I won't go into too many spoilers here, but my view is, yes, it, it absolutely does. You get a very different model, I think. For, just, for example, if you embed the, the UFO program in in the military, as opposed to the French model, where their government UFO program is embedded in their National Space Center. So, so that's what I'm going to be getting into in my lecture. And my workshop is probably even more controversial. I've just called it UFOs and Ufology, Uneasy Bedfellows. And that's a, a nod. <laughs> Again, <laughs> that's an awfully good title. I, I'll be there for sure. Uh, well, it's, it's a, a nod to a, a classic quote from Dr. J. Allen Hynek, Blue Book's scientific advisor, who, who once famously said, uh, we don't study UFOs, we study reports of UFOs. And, and so we get into all sorts of questions about what is scientific ufology, is it? Is it possible? Do governments practice that? Or are there other investigative methodologies that could be applied to, to ufology? And just really, I, I guess, giving it's, it's not for me to sit in judgment, of course, on the UFO community, but it's, it's an interesting perspective that I guess, having done this for the government, I, I sit in a slightly unusual position when I... I go out into the UFO community and give talks. Some, some people are interested. Some people probably think I'm still secretly working for them. So it's going to be a kind of, uh, I guess, um, assessment of the situation of where is ufology today? What, what is ufology? Where is it heading? So, and like all my workshops, it is totally interactive. I think quite a lot of the speakers use their workshops and their intensives just almost as a second lecture. But when I, when I do one of these, I, I really do say at the beginning, shout it out, interrupt. Um, if, if you don't agree with something, you know, say, wait a minute, what's, what's that? And my, my workshops are, are much more informal and interactive than, than the lectures, of course. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I hope mine will be too. Well, listen, I would like to thank you for spending some time with us on Dreamland and talking about contact with me. Uh, for those of you who were in, at contact in the distant past and have not been back recently, it is now at a beautiful hotel in Indian Wells, the Renaissance Hotel, and it is not anymore out in the desert where, as you know, the question was always, would the audience collapse from heat stroke before the lecturer did <laughs> you remember those days very I, well i'm I, sure Nick. i do i do I, I must say they they have a beautiful place out there in joshua tree but it, it wasn't necessarily for the faint-hearted so i i think uh, there were some people who were sorry to see them move away from there but uh, they have a wonderful new venue i i was there last year as well yeah me I, too I think, yeah they'll they'll go from strength to strength i think the main thing was uh, quite apart from the heat and, and things they i think they outgrew the 
the, the venue. And uh, well, they did. It was it was so crowded, and there was it, it, impossible to get rooms. I, uh, in fact, I think at this point, probably the conference is already uh, spilling over into nearby hotels, which there are a number of nice ones on there website, which is contactinthedesert.com. Well, Nick, we got to get together later on in the year for another show. Hopefully, there'll be some big news to share. Thank you very much for being with us on Dreamland. Thank you. Our next guest is Brad Olson, world traveler and adventurer. He's going to be at Contact in the Desert talking about a journey to Antarctica and a journey to Peru where he observed and discovered all kinds of absolutely fascinating things about the distant and lost human past. Brad, welcome to Dreamland. Thank you, Whitley. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, great. Mysteries and megaliths of South America, secrets of the Nazis, Patagonian giants, the East connection between Easter Island and the Tuanaco statues. Okay, folks, that's his workshop uh, description from from contactinthedesert uh, dot com. <laughs> Brad, can you can you enlighten us a little bit about what this is going to ha- What's going to happen when you talk about this? Sure. I just came back from four months in South America, and part of the time I was on a trip with Nistin Harriman and Brian Forrester, and we were doing all the Sacred Valley, Cuzco, Machu Picchu, all the major megalithic sites there. And it was amazing that we were on this trip with 150 people and meditating at the sites and doing oming sounding rituals and things. Uh, and to have Brian Forster as one of our guides explaining that there has been a total rethinking of all the megaliths in the Peru area, including Tiwanaku in Bolivia, that th- these are much, much older than have ever been hinted by regular archaeologists. And the whole redating of these megaliths really calls into question an antediluvian civilization that once existed here on Earth. And what the ramifications of that are is that maybe we're talking about an Atlantean civilization or even before that Lemurian civilization. Because everywhere you go, Whitley, you see that these megaliths are the oldest structure and then inferior Incan designs and even Spanish Constructions are built upon them. Which is the same so, in Egypt. It's the same in Lebanon when they when the great platform at Baalbek, which is un could not be built now. And yet it's the oldest thing there. That's correct. It's the oldest thing there. It's been there for a very long time. And it shows signs of a major earth cataclysm. Some of the sites such as Puma Punku near Tiwanaku, are just strewn about like a child's Lego set that just got upended when they were done playing with it because they're massive megalithic stones just strewn about the area, making it uh, ind- indicative that there had been some kind of major cataclysm a long, long time ago. We're talking about twelve or 11,000 years ago because Robert Schock has been to see these uh, sites as well. He was largely responsible for redating the Sphinx around 12,000 years. And he says the same about the megaliths in Peru and Bolivia, that they're much, much older, approximately 12,000 years old, not just 2,000 years old. So that is the same time, 12,000 years ago, that the last Ice Age ended. And with a tremendous bang, because God knows what happened exactly. But we do know that something struck the North American continent. The entire continent caught on fire. The ice cap collapsed. And uh, the, in, the whole Clovis people were rendered extinct, in, as well as North American camels, giant ground sloths, and all kinds of different animals. 
So something was certainly going on then. And all the ice melt would mean that the sea levels rose dramatically and very quickly. And where does civilization have its center? It has its center right on the coasts. I think you're going to do, this is going to be a fascinating lecture, folks. Uh, but there's more also in your other presentation, your free presentation, you're going to be talking about Antarctica. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of what that's going to be about? Sure. It's called The Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica. And on this same four-month trip, I did another trip within a trip, and that was 26 days sailing down to Palmer Peninsula in Antarctica and having the opportunity to speak to station chiefs, other boat captains, and people that worked on the bases. And my line of inquiry was very much about if there had been any antediluvian civilizations that they knew about, such as the megalithic blocks that Corey Good speaks of, or the um, pyramids that are supposedly poking through the ice, as well as a major uh, three-mile-long craft that uh, is featured in the ice. Uh, nobody would tell me anything about those subjects, or maybe they just didn't know. Uh, but a lot of the workers down there are seasonal, and they're all heading back right now. But we did find some tantalizing clues that there was a major sighting of disks and some orbs over the Belgrano II base, which is an Argentinian base in eastern Antarctica, and kind of a banter among the Argentinian staff that they had seen this uh, unusual sighting towards the end of last year, around December 2018. And so it was translated to us at one of the Argentinian bases on the Palmer Peninsula. It's also an established fact that there is a massive no-fly zone over the South Pole. And that's pretty unusual because there's very little flight activity that goes to the South Pole. And it's on one side of the South Pole. So this does correspond with Brian S., a whistleblower who spoke to Linda Moulton Howe in 2016, that uh, flights are diverted around the snow fly zone. Well, what makes it so interesting is the South Pole is this rumored entrance into Middle Earth or below the, the polar plateau ice cap there, and that there would be a no-fly zone there that it's strictly enforced makes it somewhat uh, unusual to have it in this particular location where this presumed hole is that Admiral Byrd said he even flew a plane into it. it was so large. That he yeah, that's right. The famous around. Admiral Byrd story. Yeah, famous Admiral Byrd story. So that does check out that there is, to this day, uh, an enforced no-fly zone right off the South Pole area. And yet, it seems to be kind of veiled in secrecy. Well, for example, back in 19... Early 90s, I think, I was in Auckland doing an author tour, New Zealand, and the town was up in arms because the U.S. Air Force was flying massive numbers of planes in and out 24 hours a day. I mean, I sat in my hotel room and watched them coming and going. It was unbelievable, G going down into Antarctica for unknown reasons. They were building something gigantic down there, it's huge. <laughs> And now, who would who would try? What about a? I mean, it's just so weird that there would be a uh, a, a no fly zone over the South Pole. <laughs> That's exactly what George Norrie said when I was on his Beyond Belief show last month, Whitley. Yeah. Why would they need that? Nobody flies down there. Yeah. So that I, I found to be one of the most compelling pieces of evidence we could get as far as areas that are off limits. Now, what makes that very interesting is that per the Antarctica Treaty, which was signed by dozens of nations in 1962 and still very much in force, is that it was created as a world biosphere, like a, a national park not owned by any nations, but for the whole world to preserve the animals, the minerals, mining, and no military activity is allowed in Antarctica per the Antarctica Treaty. Now, could 
certain covert activities take place? Well, yes. But if other nations found out about it, they would be up in arms about it. So it is a demilitarized zone in so much that uh, the military is only allowed to come in to support one of their bases, for example, to bring supplies or personnel, or for an emergency evacuation. Nothing else, because the U.S. was testing nuclear bombs uh, not far from Antarctica, perhaps even over Antarctica, still shrouded in secrecy under Operation Argus in 1958. And it was because of these, uh, along with other testing that had been taking place in Antarctica, that the Antarctica Treaty was uh, passed by these nations to stop any further testing from happening. So uh, the fact that a lot of these whistleblowers say that um, they have done secret military operations, well, they must have been very clandestine and very hidden because otherwise it's strictly prohibited. So... Well, whatever they were doing, and the Air Force was doing, I don't know, but they were certainly there in Auckland in massive force. So you're basically saying here, you know, we look back and we see what happened in uh, in the Inca world so long ago. We see Gobekli Tepe mysteriously built and then buried and we see these extraordinary megalithic monuments all over the planet. And where do you stand on all of this? Do we have any idea what our past really was or not? Well, we don't, Whitley, because there has been a concerted effort to keep the truth from the people regarding an antediluvian past, a high civilization that built megaliths on a grand scale, almost to taunt us to say, well, you, you don't even have the technology to complete this type of project today. For example, the Sacsayhuaman, which is three kilometers above Cuzco, 30-foot-tall megalith. There aren't even cranes in the world today that can move 70- no. or 90-ton blocks, just like Bellback, as you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. And, in fact, uh, in, in uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, Graham Hancock points out that the, the Spaniards made the Incas a attempt to, to demonstrate it, and they couldn't do it. No, and in fact, the Incans even said these monuments, these megaliths, were in place before we got here. We just added our temples and other features on top of it. And Whitley, you can clearly see two building styles. One is inferior, one is megalithic, and very superior. Well, gosh, you know, Brad, it's going to be a great presentation. I'm going to be at both of your lectures. In fact, I chose people to to come on Dreamland to promote Contact in the Desert, specifically who I knew would I would be at your lectures. And so I'm very excited. I have to tell you, uh, this is this is when somebody, as I always say on Dreamland, when somebody gets out there and actually does the work, it's not an armchair detective all of a sudden. This is a guy who's been there and done that and can speak from personal experience. It's going to be really exciting. Thank you very much, Brad, for being with us on Dreamland. Folks, contact in the desert. Go to contactinthedesert.com. Get your tickets. Come to Brad's lecture, come to my lecture, come to my workshop and Brad's workshop, please. And we will see you there. Now, next up, a real superstar has arrived on the shores of Dreamland. Welcome to Dreamland, Linda Moulton Howe. Well, thank you, Whitley, very, very much. We have walked a long path. You and I. We uh, sure have, Linda. Yeah, you go back into at least uh, the 70s uh, with your experiences in the woods of Accord, New York. Well, actually, that was in 19... We met in, uh, I think, February it, of 1986 at the cabin in Accord. And it, it actually was, I, re, uh, I remember, because I was working on a chemistry special uh, in New York... And I think it was the year before Communion came out because you gave me confidentially to read a working draft on Communion. Yeah, and that's uh, that's right. That was 1986. That it, well, uh, it, I I had it written down as 88. 
No, uh, Communion came out in 87, and I definitely, oh. you were there in 86. That oh, was That was you. correct. Thank you for getting this straight, which means that I've had that timeline on note uh, wrong. So it just shows, though, that there was so much going on in the 80s. That, yeah. <laughs> from animal mutilations to human abductions to so many things. And now, by 2019, I find myself doing more work more travel, uh, there are more facets, and at the top of my list is the work that I have been doing with whistleblowers, uh, legitimate and genuine Navy SEALs, uh, Marine analysts, and others on the their firsthand information about ancient archaeology deep under the ice of Antarctica, and I say ancient archaeology the surprise and the shock is to talk with several people who have been there and are talking about self-activating software that keeps the temperature inside the hallways of these structures two miles under the ice between 68 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit, that as you walk through two-mile-long hallways, uh, that the light that is this pale, strange green color follows any uh, person or group that is moving through these long, huge hallways. Two miles is the longest one uh, that was measured from satellite with a, a Navy SEAL commander who has talked to me about what his own experiences there. And he is separate from the whistleblowers that I managed to videotape, backlighted and voice altered in July of 2018. In that their story, according to the other Navy SEAL, is absolutely correct. And, and, and whole, what are those stories? If you, Yeah, and the whole question of using the term ancient architecture. If it is currently uh, temperatures that humans are comfortable in, if there are walls that can go for two miles with lighting and glowing that moves with the person, how can you say it is ancient architecture because it seems to be relevant to the modern world, but who is it relevant to? These are the questions that three years ago the Marine uh, Intelligence Analyst approached me at a conference, and I was surrounded by a large group of people asking me questions, and he leaned forward and said, I am, and gave me a name that at the <clears throat> Excuse me. At that moment, I had only seen in an email saying I have information about Antarctica, outer space, uh, and we have to be careful about communicating. But I would like uh, to meet and talk to you. This was his answer. Uh, follow up to his email was coming and appearing at this conference, and we went uh, uh, from the conference and talked for a solid seven hours about his own experiences in the military and his colleagues, one of which he grew up with from days in the Midwest, and that is the Navy SEAL commander, his longtime friend, that he it took two years for him to introduce me to. And in July of 2018, it is worth sharing this because it underscores that this work is so difficult, and it shouldn't be, that, that our government should be telling us straightforwardly about whatever the architecture is two miles down under the deep ice of Antarctica, because the more research I have done, and I'm going to be addressing this at contact uh, in the desert in 2019, what is the history known to scientists about when Antarctica was last completely free of ice, in order to build structures that the Navy SEAL commanders and others have told me from deep ground penetrating and ice penetrating radar from satellites, we know that there are at least six sites deep under the ice, and each site on average is 63 acres of structures. Good Lord. Yeah. But you know, folks, Antarctica was not always covered with ice. 
No. It, it absolutely wasn't. And in fact, the Piri Reis map would suggest that Antarctica wasn't covered with ice a lot more recently than our uh, geologists think. Well, set the Piri Reis map aside because it is so controversial. Oh, yeah. Let's not. T- I don't want to go down that road. I'm just saying. Yeah, but it, but it is a very interesting uh, data point. But the yeah. bigger picture, I spent two weeks about four or five months ago doing nothing but trying to get a consensus from scientists about what has been the evolutionary history of this large round continent that is as wide as the United States. A lot of people don't realize it. Antarctica is huge. And here are data points. I'm going to be going into this in great detail in uh, contact, uh, leading up to uh, a workshop that I'm going to be doing on the military whistleblowers and their descriptions of these huge structures deep under Antarctic ice that they've seen for themselves. Now, here is a consensus from these two weeks of research that I was uh, doing, trying to talk with scientists and doing a tremendous amount of reading, having to do with this question, when is the last time that the whole continent of Antarctica was free of ice? It appears that uh, you can go safely back to 100 million years ago, this huge round continent had by then It had disconnected from the southern Africa that had been Gondwana land or Pangaea, and it was moving, going down toward the southern hemisphere. And it took from at least 100 million years ago down to 34 million. As far as I can tell, there is no debate and there is no question that from 100 million down to 34 million about 70 million years, that huge continent moving down to the South Pole was always hot, had tropical plants. They have been able to confirm this from botany examinations of seeds and all kinds of uh, carbon uh, in layers in parts of Antarctica that they've been able to examine. And so then you get to, well, 34 million years ago, hot tropical. Why, by 33 million years ago, and this is not disputed, there was ice build up up to this one to two miles on Antarctica, and it all happened in a million years. Now, what in the world could have happened between 34 million and 33 million years ago that would have done this to Antarctica? You cannot find that 34 to 33 million years ago that there was any specific huge ice buildup in, let's say, the continental North America or South America or Central America or Europe. Uh, The last uh, glaciation of great consequence reached its maximum uh, 18,000 years ago. So we're talking... Folks, just just let me put in a little... Uh, warning here, this is a huge difference. Yeah. She's talking about 33 million years yeah. as opposed to 18,000, which is like in terms of 33 million, a quarter of a second. Yeah, exactly. And when you go back and you start reading a, as many research papers as you can get about Antarctica, you find that another one of the big mysteries and why hasn't it been publicized on our planet, along with uh, the presence of alien intelligences and everything else, who and how is this material kept so secret? And this is the big other unknown. It turns out that in Wilkes Land, which if you have a mental map of how you normally see the illustration of Antarctica with a kind of tail coming up in the upper left, and then to the down at the 6 o'clock position of most of the maps that you're shown is McMurdo. That is the USA base that is on the Ross Sea. And when you uh, go to your right looking at this map, there is a huge quadrant that it contains Lake Vostok, and it is called Wilkes 
Land, W-I-L-K-E-S, and then Land. And the South uh, Ocean is bordering that huge area. The strongest magnetic anomaly known on Earth today is in Wilkes Land, Antarctica. There are papers that have come out in just the last year or two from uh, uh, magnetic field analysis data from satellites. Great colorful maps that show how the uh, magnetic field is changing around this huge anomaly that is called officially the Wilkes Land Magnetic Anomaly. What's surprising is as much as you, I, and others have uh, tried to study magnetic fields and what happens when you try to manipulate magnetic fields and this whole concept of moving dimensional point to point that has come up so often in extraterrestrial abduction reports where uh, people in the abduction syndrome have been shown mentally or told uh, uh, telepathically that the uh, non-human intelligences move through dimensions, move through timelines, do not just move uh, like Euclidean geometry in this matter universe, and that the way they do it is by control and manipulation of magnetic fields. Now, with yeah, that, that dovetails with everything I have personally observed. Yes, Go absolutely. Ahead. This, this is now we are at the heart of the landscape of where you have a bridge between the whole human abduction syndrome, uh, the whole uh, suppression since World War II of all things related to the government's own documents about the presence of alien intelligences on our planet, underneath the surface of our planet, throughout this solar system, and going beyond into the Milky Way galaxy. And this is exactly the context that the whistleblowers are talking to me about their missions to Antarctica to these gigantic structures that shocked them, and that when I have talked with uh, the the military people, they always ask me the same question. Linda, when could these huge uh, acreages of 63 acres and six of them, when could they have been built? And we're back to that 34 to 33 million time period, and then the work that I've tried to figure out, could the Wilkes Land magnetic anomaly have something to do with what happened 34 to 33 million years ago? Now, here it is so puzzling, Whitley, because the, the, the maps, you can find the maps, you can find all the color coding about all of the magnetic anomalies, and what do you get about why? What is the magnetic anomaly? You get nothing but confusion and hypotheses from scientists who say it must be a fragment of an asteroid, a fragment of a meteorite, or a whole huge meteor that crashed. Now, they'll say crashed through the ice. Well, if it crashed through the ice, when did this occur? There is no data that gives a timeline. and now, let's, let's say scientists are in huge detail examining this magnetic anomaly. And now I'm going to jump over to the Navy SEAL commander that I was able to videotape in July of 2018, backlighted and voice altered. And I have been uh, broadcasting my segments on my Earth Files YouTube channel on Wednesday nights. I will be showing uh, at least four segments at contact. And here is the important takeaway from this interview today. With all of the science and all of the science that we are able to bring to bear on what is happening with magnetic fields, with what is happening with the magnetic poles, the possible change of pole shifts, you cannot find anything that will say definitively that we have done and looked with ice-penetrating radar, which I know that we do and can do, you will uh, hear all of this confusion and hypothesis about what could be creating this huge magnetic anomaly. 
and the Navy SEAL sits in front of my camera in July of 2018 and says, I know because I have had briefings. It is a very large craft from alien intelligences, and nobody knows if it actually crashed or if it has been placed where it is in Wilkes Land in Antarctica in conjunction with the powering of these huge structures that are two miles under ice and today are still energized with temperature and with light. How fascinating. And, you know, of course, if something like that is really there, can you imagine the benefits to mankind if that site was open to scientists to examine it? Because, you know, I know from long experience, if they are, if it stays classified, nothing gets done. Exactly. Because the people who are behind the classification barrier are too hamstrung, and mostly they are not the absolute top scientists. Like Stephen Hawking knew there was an, a possible alien presence here, and but he didn't know anything more than that, leading him to leave with a speculation that we'd better be very careful if aliens are coming here. He knew that it was somehow hostile uh, th- because they may be very dangerous to us. But think if he had really gotten into this deeply, had understood it, had gone on the various interfaces and so forth, what we could have learned from that mind. Yes, and Whitley, you listen to the Navy SEAL commanders. They are describing these huge walls. Uh, The one Navy SEAL commander who is not on video said that he was in one of the, they use the word room loosely, by satellite, the rooms have been measured to be nine square acres. Why do you need nine square acre rooms that are 30-some feet high to some kind of a perceived ceiling in the uh, the. Navy SEAL, who has, is not on video, but has confirmed for me what Spartan 1 has said, he said he was in one of these huge, vast acreage rooms where the ceiling was 80 feet high, and both Spartan 1, my Navy SEAL commander on video, and the other Navy commander not on video, but confirming, they both said to me, we could not find any support for the ceiling. That means we are used to architecture on Earth with a gravity of a specific type where we build by putting up walls or columns or pillars, and that is the way it has always happened on Earth. Pyramids would uh, fall into a category of not support walls, but that the entire pyramid itself is a structure that is self-supporting. So when you come to the question by the Navy SEALs themselves, how can you have ceilings, very visible ceilings, and there's no support? Well, I have been told very specifically that our government has had people in there, physics and and engineers, and they have identified that there must be neutralizing gravity technology that keeps the whole structure's in place, and this was added to by a physicist who talked to me about this two years ago, and he said, we know that the structures underneath the ice in Antarctica do not appear to have walls or supports. It is incomprehensible, except, he said, I can tell you, Linda, that we do know that neutralizing gravity technology very similar to what you reported back in 2007 and 2008 from the Isaac material when the dragonflies were showing up all over. And this Isaac released a a two-section document to me and to Coast to Coast that he said that he had been part of a group working for the Department of Defense in Palo Alto. It was disguised as a library, very leafy in trees, but the 
uh, underneath the leafy library were huge, vast laboratories underground in Palo Alto where they were trying to analyze extraterrestrial artifacts and that they had determined that some of the artifacts that they had would generate gravity-neutralizing fields, that was the verb, fields or noun, and that if you were aiming and knew how to aim that extraterrestrial technology that they were working at the Palo Alto commercial, uh, it was, uh, uh, let's see, Packle. It was Palo Alto commercial. They were trying to come up with a commercial way to apply the extraterrestrial technology, and that was in the acronym, uh, Application of Extraterrestrial Research. And that uh, particular neutralizing gravity instrument, this Isaac had worked on, and in the documents were photographs of it. Now, I have also been exposed by the physicist, uh, separate from the man who released uh, the Packle documents. He said that he had at Area 51 underground in the 1970s, also been exposed to gravity neutralizing technology that can focus down to like a cat all the way up to a building. And he said to me, "My, uh, I would hypothesize that what I worked on at Area 51 is exactly the technology that is self-activating. It has, as far as he was concerned, it had no energy uh, uh, diminution. It, it was not anything that would ever weaken over time as we think of energy systems running out of energy. And that would explain why, if these structures in Antarctica are 34 to 33 million years old, and they still have a temperature 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, they still have glowing walls, they still have ceilings that have no visible supports, it would all be because the technology to neutralize gravity is built into every part of every floor of every, they were walls, but not support walls, and that when the Isaac uh, scientist said, you have to look at this uh, self-activating software, that every single thing that is made with it is self-functioning and does not need intelligences to tell it what to do. It just needs to enter fields and all of the software, whether it had to do with being a spacecraft, whether it had to do with being a structure two miles under ice in Antarctica, it would know how to apply the neutralizing gravity at all times, and that would answer one of the big questions that the physicist to, uh, said to me two years ago. Linda, for anything that we know as matter on Earth to be built over huge acreages and be able to sustain two miles of ice on any of those structures, it's not comprehensible no. in Earth matter. But if you are dealing with self-activating structures that know how to neutralize the gravity between the structures and the H2O molecule, which would include two miles of ice, you would have absolutely no problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I'm working on very hard right now is why we can't see how these technologies work in the sense that we cannot see the principles of physics that must underlie them. Yeah. That we don't know. And because we don't know that, we're unable to proceed, and no amount of Battelle Memorial Institute metallurgy or so forth and so on is going to make us a, that breakthrough. This is a breakthrough that needs to be conceptual and at the level of physics before we can go ahead. Now, Linda, before we close, can you just you you mentioned the whistleblowers? Can you uh, 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 dimensionalize that a little bit for us? Who are they, and why do you feel that they are credible? Because of the documents that they have shown me, uh, because of the drawings they have done for me, 
because I have the DD-214 and a whole lot of certificates on the marine analyst, and I have been able to do an entire, uh, like a 40-minute uh, recording with the Navy SEAL commander about from his birth to his current life, everything that he did, his naval Navy SEAL training. Um, this is a man who was well-known to Ronald and Nancy Reagan. And there is a photograph that I hope someday I'm going to be able to show the public in which he is sitting at a table with both of them after he had done miracle work in a part of this uh, world. The 20 years that Spartan won, he went from high school into SEAL training. He was uh, astounding what he was capable of doing. It's astounding what any SEAL is able to do, but I happen to know records that were broken by this Spartan one. An extraordinary human being. And he himself has looked at my eyes and said, I do not think it is right for what I saw, the conversations I had with a scientist who was studying all of the carved hieroglyphs and symbols in black basalt walls. Black basalt is as hard as granite. And that there were thousands, literally thousands of glyphs. And that scientists have been trying to study these walls. And the most he could say is that when it was explained to him, it was like Mayan, it was like Egyptian hieroglyphs, but it was not either. And that these thousands of symbols carved in this hard black stone, they had used some kind of laser to determine how deep each of the symbols is, and it was always seven centimeters. So no matter what the detail or the size in width of the symbols that you could see with your eyes standing inside of these huge rooms, the depth of them carved into the black basalt was always seven centimeters, which is approximately 3.25 inches. The question that the scientist had a big discussion with Spartan 1, the Navy SEAL commander, about was we can't understand how you would make thousands of these intricate symbols and glyphs all three, uh, seven centimeters deep unless you have a technology that would somehow be able to interact molecularly with the entire black basalt walls, which may be 30 feet high or 80 feet high, and that it would mean that what is in Antarctica would be molecular manipulation of black basalt into all of these glyphs and hieroglyphs. That's it's absolutely remarkable and of course like so many close encounter witnesses i've seen hieroglyphs probably very much like the ones you're describing in my own experiences so that writing is out there all right and it reminds me also of the writing on the dragonfly drone yeah exactly. uh, which uh, which we went back and forth about it. It was a fascinating story, boy, Linda. It was, and, you know, the, it, people were jumping all over themselves to say it was all nonsense and it wasn't real, et cetera, and so forth. Well, that's counter-intel. Exactly. It's pure counter-intel, and it is not to be credited because it's not true. They, 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 those photographs were quite real. Um, now, we have come, we're good, just doing a half hour today, folks. We've come to the end of our time together, and Linda has, as always, a busy day. If you saw what Linda does in one day, <laughs> you would collapse. Believe it's me. true. It is true. Anyway, May 31 to June 3 in Indian Wells, California, Contact in the Desert. Linda Moulton Howe will be there. Obviously, it's going to be incredibly fascinating. I will be there. So many others will be there as well. It's a huge conference. I think maybe the biggest in the world or close to it. And Indian Wells in the Renaissance Hotel 
We were there for the first time last year after the boot camp in the desert in the previous years. And Whitley, I can say, it is one of the most beautiful places. It is one of the best places for a conference I have ever been, and I've been to a lot of conferences. And the sheer beauty and wonder of this hotel in Indian Wells is part of the pleasure of going to discuss all of these exciting subjects. I seriously recommend everybody listening Go to Contact in the Desert in 2019. You will not regret it. Yeah, you won't. Uh, And she's right about the hotel. Previously, for those of you who have never been, we were out in the actual desert. And so, you know, at that time of year, 107 degrees during your lecture could be something that happened to you, as it happened, I'm sure, to Linda and it did to me. In any case, uh, the Renaissance Hotel is marvelous, and the whole energy because we weren't all just melting the entire time the energy of everybody the attendees the speakers was much higher so it's a wonderful occasion don't miss it yes you've been listening to dreamland be sure to tune in again next week dreamland is brought to you by unknowncountry.com and its family of subscribers unknown country was founded by ann streber our news editor is matthew frizzell Our coordinator is Amy Safrankova. Whitley Streber is your Dreamland host, and I'm your announcer, Ted Alexander. Thank you for listening.